Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Idea to Value podcast. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn, and I'm thrilled to have with me today Dr. Rob Weiner. He is a writer, a professor, 90% retired happy creator, as he uh, describes himself, uh, but also probably best known for his book, uh, Creativity and Beyond. Today, we're going to be talking about the past, the present, and the future of creativity. Dr. Weiner, it's wonderful having you here today. It's great being here, Nick. I've so enjoyed uh, looking at your uh, blog and listening to your podcast and, and meeting you now live and, and conversing with you. It's delightful. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. I'm happy to have you too. Welcome to the Idea to Value podcast, where in every episode we highlight the latest insights into creativity and innovation from experts around the world. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn. I care about the evidence behind what makes ideas happen, and I've already helped thousands of people just like you through my unique insights into recent scientific findings of how creativity works. I also show you how to turbocharge innovation programs so they finally deliver on the value and ideas you've been struggling to execute. Get your free training on how creativity can be improved by registering now at www.ideatovalue.com. Now let's get on with today's episode. Now, Dr. Weiner, for people who don't know about you, oh, or you're um, what's, what's the best, uh, best way to describe where you came from and uh, how you got to where you are now? Wow. Well, I, I was born in a shack. No, I was not born in a shack. Um, I was born in a, in a middle-class family in, in New England, not ye merry old. And... Um, I've had a, a very full life and interesting experience educationally. I went to multiple universities here in the United States and one in Germany. So I can relate to where you are. I went to the University of Cologne at the end for my doc doctorate. But um, then I was a, a journalist for four years and uh, I enjoyed that greatly, but unfortunately our venture didn't work out. And uh, I've already apologized to Nick, folks. I, I've been dealing with a summer cold or hay fever or something like that. Um, let me uh, take a sip here. It's all good. That, that deep voice comes along beautifully <clears throat> in, uh, in a podcast interview. <laughs> well, that's very good. Okay. <laughs> um, but um, then I went and I've, I taught college or university for nearly 40 years and uh, at a variety of schools. And one of the ironies of creativity is often that you encounter roadblocks and then it's a question of what you do with them. And uh, in my case, I was never able to get a tenure track position, which I don't even know if that term exists in, in Europe at this point. Um, but it, I'd never got a, a university position that would lead to uh, a future uh, full professorship. And so I took courses wherever the university uh, or a university in the area would, would allow me to teach them. And to do it, I would constantly stretch. I, I would have to, it would be as if you had a, a job in, in one field and the and the employer said, well, we don't need that anymore, but could you learn to do this? And that's how I grew as a person and in, in, in terms of my, my learning and everything. And, and then I became the coordinator of interdisciplinary studies. And even that was not a, a tenurable position. So I, I, I broadened a lot. Then, for multiple reasons, um, <laughs> I was in, asked by, uh, by a woman at a conference to take over her course on creativity. And I said, well, how do I do that? And she said, well, you're creative, make it up. And <laughs> so, so I, I took that on and then wrote a book about creativity after spending 10 years talking to everyone I could find about the subject and traveling and learning and reading. And since then, I have, I wouldn't say gone rogue, but I have turned from being primarily an, a person analyzing the subject of creativity to one who is 
reveling in it himself. Uh, I, I spent 10 years performing uh, a play about the life of Leonardo da Vinci, and uh, I um, invented new courses that I've taught. Uh, at some point, even though I am still teaching at the college once one month a year, I started writing fiction about three years ago, and that grew out of a dream. And I've just been writing so feverishly, so happily. Uh, feverish sounds like you're, you're not happy, but I'm, I've been thrilled. I've been totally enthusiastic. Um, and it's, as um, one writer many years ago wrote, Jacint Mahali, uh, I'm in flow and I can just do this all day long. And I have to remind myself, there are trees out there. There are friends out there. There's my family to pay attention to. There's, there's exercise to be had, you know? <laughs> well, it can be wonderful, but uh, it can get a bit distracting every now and again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very uh, life well lived as, as uh, we could probably describe it. Uh, and it's interesting you mentioned Leonardo da Vinci because one of the reasons I uh, wanted to get in touch with you uh, is because of your work in your book, Creativity and Beyond, which, uh, which really shed some light in my eyes about how people used to think about creativity, uh, not just during Leonardo's time, during the Renaissance, but even before then. So if we, if we were to talk about the past and how creativity was looked at, especially in what we'd call ancient times, um, could you just give us some insights about what it was like back then? Well, since I am kind of ancient, yes, I <laughs> I'll go back there. But I think what is important and surprising to most people in our era is to realize that there was no word creativity before the 1870s. And hardly anyone on earth even spoke about creativity until 1950 or so. Um, most languages of the world have had no equivalent and have had to adopt the uh, English word creativity. It's also in French, obviously, um, um, and, and in all the Romance languages. But if this term became invented when people realized that uh, that the work of scientists, for example, and the work of a poet and the work of a painter and the work of a musician, the way they were working had certain parallels. They found, they similarly prepared and found inspiration and, and, and it gestated for a while before it came out. And then they, they had to follow through on it. And then, once it was conceived that there was something called creativity, it changed a lot of people's perspectives because until then you were creative in a particular realm. And what's more, the, the once you, you expanded beyond the classical high cultural issues of great art, great science, great literature or whatever, you could include everything. So we now have, we've had for a long time now, about 20 years, creative cooking, creative parenting, creative real estate development. Now, obviously people were not thinking in those terms, even in the 1850s, as creative as they were. But if you go back further to the Renaissance and then to ancient Greece and so on, people didn't just not have a term that transcended disciplines and didn't have a term that transcended, that could be applied to people of all walks of life. They didn't have the term at all. In the Western world, it was God who created. In the Hebrew Bible, God creates, and the word that they use is bara, to create. You know, I'm sure you've heard um, 
the, the word used in Arabic as well. And um, when people tried to, uh, to do things, to make things, however beautiful they were, however poetic they were, that word bara was not used for them because the biblical view was God creates, humans make, and they make from pre-existing material that God has already made. That resonated, that, that became the Western view, you know, f until, the, until the Renaissance, till about 1500, you had the idea that only God create. And then, well, maybe it was in the early, four, it was maybe 1420 or so that poets and inventors began to feel that they were making something that didn't exist before. In terms of the ancient Greeks, I mean, think about it. They, when Homer writes the uh, the Odyssey, did Homer write the Odyssey? <laughs> yeah. oh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, yeah. The Iliad and the Odyssey, yes, of course he did. When Homer writes the Odyssey, he starts off by saying, sing to me, O muse. It's not me, Homer, writing this down. It's the muse, the goddess, singing through me. Now, if you look around the world, there's still millions of people, probably billions of people, who view whatever they're creating as divinely inspired. It's not that they're claiming to be God, it's that they feel what all thanks are due to a God or a goddess or whatever, or the spirit. And there's, it's totally understandable uh, that people would feel that way because uh, as I said, I'm, when I'm writing, I'm on fire. I, I just feel it's not, it's just pure pleasure. And, and it's a gift. I can understand it being a gift. Uh, it is for me. And I, I think you'd want, um, you'd want to thank somebody, right? Um, I, if you imagine a society in which human creativity is attributed to the divine, and then furthermore, a society where women, for example, are restricted to create whatever creativity could exist in, in being in the home or in the women's sphere, or a society in which half the people are slaves and whatever creativity they produce is then presented to the world in the name of the owner, you're in a very different space from our lives here. And granted, we have plenty of people who suffer from prejudice and restrictions, and there are plenty of societies in the world in which um, individuals are very limited in what they can do. But it, it, was, a, it was a very different situation. Um, I mean, I could go into far more details, but uh, I, maybe you have some other questions. I, I, I do, certainly. I think uh, it, it's interesting you used uh, the, the, the muse um, uh, in, in these ancient times uh, as people thinking that their creativity was coming from the muse. When people nowadays hear about muses, they might think about a beautiful woman who who you want to write something for uh and they think oh right. this is this is this is the reason that i am creating it's for someone else or maybe i look at them and i'm inspired but i'm the one making something uh but back then the muses were something very fundamentally different they were as you say spiritual or even godlike isn't that right well they were definitely divine in, in Greek uh, thinking. And uh, it's interesting to think of the Museon in Alexandria the, the, and, and our word museum now and, uh, and how we collect objects and put them up. And the whole environment that, that 
gave birth to, you know, if you, if you look at a, a Greek sculpture or for that matter, uh, something uh, from an Igbo sculpture from Nigeria, um, they might be used for a specific ritual. They might be the result of a specific um, divine command. And I think it's also important to, to remember that, you know, for the Greeks, sculpture and architecture and most of the arts were techne, technologies. And what, the reason that they were technologies in our sense of the word techne is that there were repetitive formulas for them. Most creators throughout history followed strict rules. Uh, even today, if you want to learn to be a great pianist, you practice and you practice and you practice and you play the works of the predecessors from Beethoven to, Be to John Lennon to um, Tweedy playing today or whoever, whomever. You following the example of the ancients who themselves were following divine rules in many cases was very different from what we do today. We get in front of a, our, our desktop or laptop or iPad or phone and we're creating. We're just taking it and going with it. And sometimes things luckily come out great, but unquestionably having good training, having a good education. And I'm not just saying this out of self-interest <laughs> as a professor, <laughs> it is self-interested for sure. But I, I do think preparing and learning a field, being an apprentice in some manner is super, super helpful. That said, I've been trying to apprentice myself to, uh, uh, to people who are 18 years old at, at, at the university. You can show me how to do a blog, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. I think the, the, the apprentice model, it, it goes back so far into history uh, and a lot of people associate it with learning the craft. And uh, this, this idea of craft, it's also very fascinating to me how people saw what they produced from their own hands throughout history, through the ancient mm -hmm. Romans and the ancient Greeks. If they were saying uh, a, a divine spirit is creating something through me, I'm just the tool that they're using. Effectively, they are the ones who are creating instead of me. Then you come to the Renaissance and slowly but surely, you still have people like Michelangelo saying there was already a sculpture in this block of marble and yeah. I just set it free. But you yeah. also then slowly but surely have painters uh, and, and sculptors and scientists who are taking on more and more ownership for the reason that something has been created. And that brings us to where we are today, where for fortunately for more than 100 years now, we've had a word to describe the fact that we are able to create things ourselves, creativity. Um, so m moving from the past into the present and, and into the future, uh, what, what do you see around creativity, either in your own creativity or, or people's understanding of their own creative ability? What's next? Well, the, uh, obviously, those, that's a, the gazillion dollar question. Uh, I, I think part of that is up to each and every one of us. I, I know uh, that um, having time to be, you know, one of the things I address in the book is that uh, almost anything can be both a block and a spur to creativity. Uh, you know, I, I reviewed the processes of many creators throughout history and talked to many contemporary uh, creators and <clears throat> one door shuts and some people stay behind it and that's the end of the story. And uh, the door shuts and somebody figures out a way 
to go elsewhere or drill through it or whatever. And that is our each individual's personal challenge. And people like you, Nick, are helping broaden people so that they can do that. I, I certainly tried to do that. Um, and, and, you know, there are creativity courses and exercises and everything. But I think so much of it is is feeling worthy. Now, obviously, you need to feel, you know, every creator looks for recognition, I think. But the best creators create anyway, don't care about it. I mean, I certainly, I'm, if my novels don't get published, they don't get published, big deal. I've loved writing them. It's easy for me to say at this point in my life, I've got my life together, sort of. Um, you know, it's always a work in progress, right? Absolutely. <laughs> um, but we want the recognition, but we can't live from that. We have to love ourselves. You know, the, the, the biblical phrase is love thy neighbor as thyself and God and above all and so. If you, you can't begin to love your neighbor if you don't love yourself. And that's not being egotistical, that is trusting. You know, you are a mystery to yourself, usually, but you gotta trust it. And the same with creativity. And um, if you trust that, something will happen, that the spark will come of eventually, it usually does. And if it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, I spent, had a nice, um, a wonderful evening uh, a few nights ago with some friends. <clears throat> and two of them said, um, I would love to write. I've been er eager to write. One woman said she had taken three creative writing classes, but still couldn't write. And I was shocked because she was very eloquent. She was a good speaker. I thought, well, come on, just talk. Just, just why put it down on a piece of paper or in a, on a keyboard? Speak, let it, if, and, and then read what you've written and edit. And, and she, was, she kept thinking, this is coming from inside me to outside there. And I'm, I was saying, no, it's you go to what's out there. It comes back to you. you it's a constant dialogue. And then you show it to other people and it's not any longer a dialogue, but a group discussion. Well, I don't know if you should say that, Rob, you know, <laughs> whatever. Um, so that's on the, on the personal level, on the, on the societal level. I think many of us are pretty clear about the fact that we want a world that is individualistic, pluralistic, and collective. And that's a hard combination. Those are often contrary things. We want the world to, to function together. We want our individual strengths to, to be developed, our interests to be developed. And we cluster ourselves in groups. And um, we're gonna constantly dance along that. Um, I don't know how much time we have left. We've, we've got another couple of minutes, so that's fine. Okay. okay, so as I was saying before, before I got politically agitated there about lying, the course I was teaching was an interdisciplinary look at lying, you know, across wall phone fields from um, uh, lie detection to the psychology of it, to the ethics of it, to lying in different fields and so on, to, to deception in the animal kingdom and uh, camouflage and so on. Lying is 
Uh, uh, we're, we're in a world where many of us intellectuals, and I would throw myself into that pool, um, many of us accept the premise that there is not one absolute truth. And that there are multiple truths. And then in some cases, we don't know if there's any this is my sense of it right now. Um, so in a world where truth itself is questioned like this, lying becomes really easy. And the, the right wing grasp for security against all the changes in, in world history and against all that creativity brings forth and against the, the issue of, oh my God, if, if the truth isn't clear, how are we gonna survive? Well, I think that's our challenge right now to figure out how we can find consensus, how we can find operating truths, how we can work together, even disagreeing about what it is. And I think that's where our future creativity comes in because we can't deal with climate change if we're disagreeing with it. We can't deal with economic disparity if we can't deal with it, um, with racism, with anything. Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's some big challenges in our time. I'm always a big fan of, uh, finding the truth and uh, there's there's uh, areas where hopefully logic prevails and, and facts prevail and there's areas where we can then use those to find creative solutions rather than trying to find creative solutions to disprove facts or yes. <laughs> against facts malevolent yes. creativity is, as it's sometimes called yeah, um, and creativity yeah. is a huge part of this challenge absolutely um Dr. Weiner, it's been absolutely wonderful speaking with you. I think if people uh, want to find out more about you, your insights, your books that you're working on or you've already published, uh, what's the best place they can go to find out more? Well, I have a, a blog in process, so I, I'm not going to send anybody there yet, but you can always write to me individually at rob at creativityandbeyond.com. And... Um, I've got a website with the same name. You can try to contact that. Uh, you know, one of the things I'm sure that Nick has actually addressed is the uh, is that creators or creative people. <laughs> I, I, it sounds immodest, but I I know I'm, it, that's just where I'm at. Um, creators don't want to spend their time in the marketing because they're so busy doing other things, but as Nick says, you should treat that as part of one of your creative aspects. And, and he's not the only one who says that, but you said it well. <laughs> uh, you, you need to um, figure out how to get the message out there that you want to get out there. Uh, it, it's not a field of dream scenario where if you build it, people will come. <laughs> Unfortunately right. for, uh, I, I've, I have that same challenge with a lot of the content I put out there myself. Uh, but uh, Dr. Weiner, it's been wonderful speaking with you. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, I look forward to speaking again with you soon. I look forward to it as well, Nick. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked it, please like, share and subscribe and leave me a comment about what you thought and what you'd like to see more about. If you want to take your creativity and innovation capabilities to the next level, then invest in yourself with the premium training only available at ideatovalue.com. These exclusive training modules have all been put together by me, Nick Skillicorn, and have been used by thousands of artists, innovation leaders, and CEOs to become better at understanding the source of their creativity and executing on their innovation ambitions. And there is no risk to new, as they are backed by our money-back guarantee. Now, don't forget to go out there and make your ideas a reality. See you again soon.